Claude Lanzmann, great pleasure to have you here tonight. Let's start with something that Antonin mentioned many things which we will be talking about, but let's start with your obsession. I mean, you call it that way, your obsession with the guillotine. Your obsession, you, you say in the book, the guillotine more generally, capital punish, punishment and the various methods of meeting our deaths has been the abiding obsession of my life. I'd like us to see an image, please, if we could. This image struck me when I was thinking and reading your book. This image was drawn by Victor Hugo. You probably know it. <laughs> and I'd like you to develop a little bit where this obsession comes from and how it started to haunt you. And this is not the guillotine. No, this is not more general, no, oh. la pendaison. You know, there is, I don't know if there is a picture of Hugo, of the guillotine. There is a picture I was looking for of a head that is floating in air, no. but I couldn't find it. All right. But talk to me a little bit about your obsession with a cut. I will try. Try. I am not sure to be, to be able because uh, among the seven words, you, you asked me to choose, and uh, Antonin Baudry enumerates them. Uh, this evening, there is only one which uh, wins over all the others, which predominates. And forgive me, but it's, it's because I, I am in front of you. It is fear. <laughs> I am sweating with fear. <laughs> it's absolutely true. And it is not uh, very good, uh, these are not very, very good uh, conditions to, to have a... But at least I started... To have a deep discussion. At, at least I okay. started with something light. I, <laughs> I try to answer you. Uh, I, I say this in, in my book. It happened to me, I was very, very young when I, I was... Uh, my maid took me to the cinema, and this was a film of, uh, called uh, L'Affaire du Courrier de Lyon. And there is a man who, is, who you can see absolutely clearly the guillotine and the blade of the guillotine falling on the neck. And the man was uh, innocent. Um, and I was always uh, scared very much. Terrorist. I cannot, uh, even now, it's difficult for me to, to, if I see in a book or in a newspaper, uh, an image of uh, the guillotine, it's uh, difficult for me to, to, to look at this image straight. I, uh, I have pain, it's difficult. And the real question is how, uh, uh, death can be inflicted as a pain, as a punishment. How do you say capital punishment? Mm. It's a question I have no real answer for this, but I was uh, haunted all my life um, by this, uh, this question. There is a beautiful story which has not much to do with me, uh, but it's a true story. Uh, during the French uh, Revolution, during the reign of the terror, uh, one uh, aristocrat was uh, led to the guillotine in order to be, be beheaded. beheaded. That's what you say. And he was on a cart with a, pulled by horses. But I don't know how this happened, but he generally they had their hands tied in the back, but not, he, not this man. I don't know by which uh, generosity was uh, of the guards. And he was reading a book. And he didn't stop to read the book during all the way, a rather long way, till the place of the 
execution. But when he, when he arrived uh, just at the foot of the l'échafaud, of the guillotine, and when the hanker wanted to hanker, you say, wanted to, to tie his hands, he said, one second, and he just took the book like this, and he took the corner of the page, <laughs> and he did this. And uh, <coughs> as if beheaded, he would go you know, it's, it's with his, extra with I mean, the story is extraordinary, partly because it speaks of it's a, a... beautiful story. Yeah. Though speaks of a future, but you know, it's interestingly enough, it... That is... No, no, it's, it would be the third degree Gestapo, your projector. Um, let's bring it down one degree, if we could. Um, but it's an interesting story also because it reminds me of something that was done in literature. Um, since we were looking at an image of uh, Victor Hugo, mm -hmm. um, you, you probably know Le Dernier Jour d'un Condamné, yes. a text that, that Hugo wrote when he was 29 years old, mm -hmm. and where he has the main character, Le Condamné, the condemned man, right up to the moment that he comes on the échafaud. And Dostoevsky, who read the book, said that it was the most realist description ever written of capital punishment. Realist because in some way he had been like the stenograph, like a stenographer of human yes. emotion. He had gotten into the brain okay. of the condemned man. Now, the, the obsession with, with uh, uh, the guillotine is also w woven in in the book <coughs> with your interest in the last glances. In what? The last, les derniers regards. Les regards. And I, I'd like you to say something about these last glances. The fact that, in some way, le, le, le départ dès le début. You, you are, you're leaving people. Yes, of course. Uh, I was always haunted on, uh, by this. And when I started to work on, uh, on Shoah, I had not so many ideas at the moment, and I did not know how I would cope with such a, such a subject. subject. Mm. And, but there were some uh, obsessions, personal obsessions that I had. So, you are right. The, the first uh, moment of the arrival of uh, Jews in an extermination camp, and the first moment where the last, it, uh, it was exactly uh, collapsed, the same. Collapsed yeah. into one. Yeah. And it was the most uh, very violent death, too. And now this is a parenthesis, but I think that there are only violent deaths, the so-called uh, natural deaths. I don't believe in this. Death is always violent. Even if you die in your bed, it is violent for the person who dies and violent for the people who remain. So. At, the very, at the very beginning of the book, you, you talk about torture and courage and cowardice. And you say, how many times have I wondered how I would react under yes. torture? And every time my answer has been that I would have been incapable of taking my own life. Yes. And then you say the question of courage and cowardice is the scarlet thread that runs through this book, the thread that runs through my life. Absolutely. I had to say this because if you write such a book, you, you have to be clear, clear and sincere. And I think I, I was in this book, I am. And it is true, um, it was a real uh, question. And uh, sometimes it happens to me to think that what I did, because I took uh, very serious risks, I, I was, uh, I put myself uh, really in, uh, in danger. 
on the, but I didn't face uh, the real question. And the real question was uh, precisely what, what you said, how would I uh, behave? Would, I don't know the concordance des temps, excuse me. Um, if I had been caught by the Germans and tortured, and the tortures of the Gestapo were something very, very serious. They didn't take pictures. It was not Abu, Abu Ghraib. Um, and uh, there are people who are really heroes, and I know I knew some of them who, being um, nobody can say, nobody can predict but we didn't want to, to go through this test to, will, I be possible, will it be possible for me to stand, stand the torture without talking. They were not sure and they killed themselves before. Uh, I, am not, I am absolutely not sure I would have had the real courage to do this. It is the reason why, uh, if I am uh, clear with me and sincere, uh, all what I have done is uh, amateurism. I don't know if you say this in English, amateurism. It Just exists. that way, yeah. Mm. Alors, there is nothing to be proud of. Something to be ashamed of? Maybe it's uh, going a little bit too far, but why not? <laughs> why not? I accept. <laughs> because this is a real test. And I, I talk in this book about the so-called, it, it was a, Sartre liked very much this expression, the, the courage militaire, the military courage. The people who killed immediately themselves. And, uh, but it is, uh, you are right, it is a, a, a red thread in, uh, in this, this book all along. Uh, because um, This was uh, at, uh, this is at the core of a film like Shoah, for instance. The whole question of the people of the the Jews of the Zonderkommando, who were uh, as uh, working between brackets because it was not a work uh, at the last stage of the destruction process of the, and I choose only these people because they had been the only witnesses of the death of the Jewish people, with the killers, of course, because they used to work in the crematorium and with the corpses and to, to watch uh, the, the, the people when they undress themselves before going under the whips inside the gas uh, chambers. And uh, there are people who ask uh, absolutely obscene questions. Why did they accept this? Why didn't, didn't they commit suicide, precisely? Well, you have passages in this book Yes. Where you, you say the, the will to life. I consider that these people, uh, these Jews of the Thunder Commando, most of them were uh, very decent, uh, honest, uh, good, good men. They were only men, there were no women. Uh, and uh, they were simple, intelligent good, but they privileged life, the value of life, of their own life, because there is only life. 
There is a film which has been shot about me uh, two years ago in France for the French television. They asked me, I was asked, do you have a title for this film? And I took uh, as a title one of the sentences of uh, uh, a man of the Zondo Commando. I think it was Yael Jankowski, who Salman Leventhal. Leventhal. Salman Leventhal. Uh, on the, before the uprising of the Zondo Commando in October 1944 in uh, Auschwitz uh, Birkenau, they buried in the mud around the commando, they buried uh, what they had written day after day, the chronicle of the, of the hell, of the inferno. Um, and um, one of them wrote, it is Salman Leventhal, one wants to live because everybody lives, one wants to live because there is only life. And it is a title I have asked to the people who made this film about me. There is only life. I mean, the, the, the lines here read, but it is Salman Leventhal, the admirable Froissart of the Zonda Commando, who in his upright handwriting best answered the obscene question. The truth is, he wrote, <coughs> is that you want to live at any cost. You want to live because you are alive, because the whole world is alive. There is nothing but life. No, my brothers, you were not the cadets of Saumur Cavalry School in 1940, defending the bridges of the Loire, prepared to die in the Hegelian manner for honor and the war of consciousness. No, you hated death, and in its kingdom, you have sanctified life absolutely. Yeah. In the kingdom of death. Um. You were, you were talking uh, a minute ago about the honesty that you were striving towards. Yes. This book, it's a small, a small question, but you can give a big answer. This book was dictated. Uh, you ask me why yes. did I dictate? Yes, this book was dictated. Yes. I, I'm, I'm wondering what the process of dictation versus the process of writing. I will try, but one has to, to make, a, to give a topographical explanation. Okay. Uh, I was not walking like in a, in a romantic film and, uh, <laughs> and dictating <laughs> the thing non-stop. No, no, it was not like so, this. So tell me. Um, I was sitting at your, at your place. Here was a table, and on the table there was a computer, and near the computer there was a second screen, uh, larger, connected with the computer. And uh, I was sitting here, and the Juliette Simon, to whom I dictated the book, was sitting there. We were sitting next to each other, and uh, okay, uh, between the first page of this book and the second one, uh, one year passed. <laughs> one, one year yes. elapsed, yes. Because uh, I was not in a hurry to... <laughs> <laughs> and I hesitated, I would not... I was... Um, no, because when it struck, in the book by various moments where you say, but, no, but I'm uh, discovering something new, I digress. I, I try to, to, to explain you. I had other things to do. Uh, I had to deal with my films, with uh, Les Temps Modernes. I am the director of, of this uh, magazine, created by Jean-Paul Sartre, and life, Simply life requires uh, time for me, you know. It's a very simple fact to, to live and the requisites of 
life for me, okay? It takes me a lot of time. And I think it is worthwhile. Um, okay, but she was very patient because <laughs> so sometimes I stopped for uh, one minute, two minutes, one hour, six hours, or several days. And she was still sitting there. No, because <laughs> in order to go on, in order to go on, I am. I have to be sure that uh, it is uh, perfect. I have to uh, to have my back against uh, the wall, uh, the wall of the perfection. I can't go on. I'll you know, uh, we'll come back to that later. But I think this image of being patient and having one's back on the wall mm. is something that we might talk about when we talk about your methods in, in Shoah. It's okay. very interesting. Don't be too intelligent, please. Uh, well, um, okay, I'll, um, <laughs> but uh, um, let's talk, no. let's talk for a moment. No, no, um, I, about no I, I did not finish to explain you well. Okay. Well, did, 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 did. Um, and uh, I, di I didn't make a plan, you know. I did not know where I was uh, going. And uh, you did th not. There, are many, there are many things in this book. I did not know that I would, uh, that I would uh, integrate them in the book. Things which are very personal and very private. But the more I was uh, writing or dictating, it is exactly the same for me. I dictated many things during my life. There is another book of me which just was released in France, a book of uh, articles I wrote or I dictated during my life. Uh, it was nothing new for me to, to dictate, but I, di <laughs> I don't walk like this. I am sitting, and, um, and the sea. I was offered. Uh, I never learned to to type, you know, and I was offered a computer after Shoah, and uh, I discovered the marvelous uh, possibilities of this uh, tool. Uh, and what was important for me is to, to see immediately my, my thoughts uh, inscribed on the screen, objectively. objectively you know. uh, I was very often fed up with my own uh, handwriting. And uh, there is a sentence of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Of he the said, stickiness, right? What? He talks about the stickiness. La no, no, my own writing, when I am anguished, like now, when I am anguished or when I am uh, in fear, which happens very often, or uh, when I am tense or tired, uh, my own writing changes. Uh, Sartre wrote this about himself, that he would discuss it with his own, own writing, which was really very beautiful, anyhow. Uh, he says in Fr French, gluante de tous mes sucs. Translate this, please. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I invoke the notion of stickiness, of, uh, um, yeah, it's more or less. Okay, that. Alors, it was beautiful for me to see the, what I dictated immediately printed, like in a book. But I was, uh, since I did not uh, learn to type, I was using the, the computer in a, in a too slow manner. I had the objectivation of my thoughts, but I lost the momentum because I was like a, a cop in the former uh, in the first time they type with one, uh, one finger. Uh, 
to, today they, they master completely the, the computer, the, the people of the police. They learn this. It is the reason why Juliette Simon, she gave me her hands, her fingers. And she has a wonderful presence, uh, inspiring. And it was, um, and the, the more I, uh, I wrote, or the more I dictated, as you wish, I prefer to say I wrote because it is the same. Uh, the more I had pleasure to, to, to write this book, and I decided that many things which I, I didn't plan to integrate should be in the book. Well, m maybe it's natural for me to ask you to give me one example of something the, that came about that you the didn't... The death of my sister, for example, the suicide of my sister. Every, every it, was a, it is a very diffi difficult chapter because uh, I was obliged to, to, to tell her life. She committed suicide at the age of 36 uh, to, to gather all this and to, to write a, a complete chapter only about my sister, her life and her death. I didn't foresee this, but I was pushed to do it. Did you foresee writing about the discovery you made about, about your... What? Did you foresee writing about the discovery you made about your father? Which discovery? The discovery that he too was in La Résistance. <coughs> Did I foresee what? This? Yes, that you would write about it, because it's something that you discovered. Yes, but uh, I think it was absolutely important to, to relate uh, this. Uh, maybe I did not foresee, but uh, it was sure that uh, I would have to, to write about this. At one because moment in, 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 in at one moment in the book, you you talk about your relationship with your father, and you talk about not betraying your father. And you have a line which is quite extraordinary from Camus, where you say, "Like Albert Camus, who condemned the blind terrorism of which his mother might have been a victim during the war in Algeria, saying, I believe in justice." <coughs> but I will defend my mother before justice. Yes. I too instinctively chose my loyalty to my father over to my loyalty to the party, which refused to keep its words. The party, when as you said that it's a communist party. How, how, how were they about to betray him? How? Were they about to betray him? If I had... Uh obey to the Communist Party, to the orders they gave me, it would have been a real betrayal of my father because there was an agreement between the two resistance uh, movements, between the Communists and between the organization of my father, a Gaullist one. And, uh, there was a real uh, deal, a real agreement, uh, I was almost decorated by the Communist Party. They were so happy. Because they had a real problem. The problem uh, of the Communists during the war was to, to get weapons. And the, there was only one way for them to get weapons. It was to take the weapons on the enemy to kill Germans. Hmm? Uh, and, um, the, I wrote, uh, I don't know if it's fair for, for me to, to talk about this now, but I, I know that Richard Brody is not far from here. Um, and I thank you for your beautiful uh, article in the New Yorker. But you made just a mistake. 
and it is not your fault. You, you, you made uh, songs and compliments to the translator, but it is a mistake because uh, the translator of this book um, is not Mr. Frank White. Uh, I had to to revise line after line his uh, translation because it was full of horrible mistakes, and you will see why I I talk about this. Um, and in the British the British publisher of this book, it is the same. Uh, the same uh, translation, but the British publisher acknowledged black and white and the second page of the, of the credits of the book, that I was the one who revised the book last uh, summer, or three months, line after line. This Mr. Frank Wine had no, no literary knowledge, and no historical knowledge, which is even more, more grave. And uh, I come back to my... But it's not your fault, it's somebody. <laughs> uh, because now the translation is good. Um, alors, I, I tell you why. Uh, I, uh, I said, I write in the book that the communists were uh, excluded of the parachutage of weapons um, given to the French resistance by the Allied forces, by the British and the Americans. Uh, and that these weapons were uh, given only to the Gaullist resistance. General de Gaulle. Uh, Mr. Frank Wine, before the revision by me, Mr. Frank Wine uh, translated uh, in the following way uh, the communists were excluded of the parachute and so on, uh, which were given only to the French resistance, as if the communists were not uh, French, you know. And it is terrible because the last 70 years are a tsunami with the fall of the, of the communism, of the Soviet Union, and so on, of the Berlin Wall. These people know nothing anymore. It has been the core of our life. But, uh, and it is a very small example. And uh, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroud promised me to acknowledge, if there is another uh, edition of this book, to acknowledge to, that to uh, come back the to revision your, had been made to, by me. To come back to your, to, to your father, he, um, he prepared you at every given moment yes. for the... He was, a, yes, he was a, a very pessimist man, and he was sure that the worst uh, was sure would be, would arrive. He how, was, how, this is a question I've, I've been wondering, is how early on did you find out about the camps? If you want the most uh, honest uh, answer, I do. <laughs> truly, truly, when I started my work uh, on shore, before I had uh, just a result, an abstraction, six million died, but it is nothing, it's just a figure. Uh, and uh, yes, it is a, the honest answer. 
So the Jews seem, because they are Jews, that they have the inner knowledge ready. It's not true at all. One has to work and show up to, to make sure it will really work. So to come back once more to your father, your father was pessimistic and knew that the Shoah was coming. What did he... He, he did not know that the Shoah was coming because it was impossible really to, to foresee such an horror. But he knew that it would be horrible, surely. Uh, the very first day of the defeat of France, when there was a famous speech of the Maréchal Pétain saying that he, he had asked for a ceasefire to the Germans. I was uh, not very old. I was, uh, it was in 1940. I was, uh, how old was I? 15. Already, yes. <laughs> uh, Maybe 14. More, more 14 than 15, yes. Because I was born very late in 25. <laughs> Um, somebody gave me a dog, a beautiful small dog, uh, a chien, a Danois, Danish. Uh, and I loved him very much. He was uh, three months old. And my father, having heard the speech of the Maréchal Pétain, took me aside and told me, um, we cannot keep your dog. I said, why? He told me, uh, we have to, starting now, we have to live unseen. We cannot be seen. And your dog will become a very remarkable dog. They are beautiful, very high. And, uh, and I started to, 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 to scream, to, to, to refuse, but... Um, okay, he gave the dog to a veterinary, to a, who was probably drunk, I don't know, but he, he killed the dog. Made, uh, it was a moment, to, all the animals have to be, to get an injection to survive, to, to, to live. He made a mistake. But maybe my father told him to kill the dog because uh, the dog would, uh, would, uh, would grow up very high and they need a lot of, uh, of meat, these, uh, these dogs. And he thought that this would be very difficult. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, but this question, uh, you know, the Jews are even at the door of the, of the gas chamber. We have many scenes like this in the Shoah. They, they refuse to, even if they had the evidence in front of their eyes, they refuse. And Philip Muller, who is one of the main protagonist of uh, Shoah, this beautiful uh, sentence, who wants to live is condemned to hope. At the very door of the gas chamber when the Germans told the Jews to undress, we will uh, clean you, clean and not kill, but it was the, the Jews believed it. Alors, euh, donc, tout forcer ce chan aurore was, um, it was uh, impossible. And you, your question, when did I know? I knew when I started to work. In, um, 
in your adolescence, early adult life, one book had an incredible power over you. Reflexion sur la question juive. And you talk about it quite early on in the book. You say, with every line, book published in 1946, with every line, I felt alive <coughs> again. Or, to be more precise, I felt I had been given permission, and in italics, to live. Later, I came to the description of what Sartre calls the Jewish innocenticity. And in it, I suddenly found a portrait perfectly depicting myself. It's true, yeah. It's true, there are two things which uh, remain uh, unequaled in this book. It is a portrayal of the anti-Semite that uh, written by Sartre, it's uh, wonderful. It has not uh, even today one wrinkle. The portrayal of the anti-Semitic passion, because it is a passion. A passion. And, uh, passion, la passion anti-Semite. And the description of the, what he calls the inauthentic uh, behavior of the Jews. Many Jews are like this, I was like this. How so? Because I was a child, a conformist, like uh, most of the child, of the children, pardon. Um, embarrassed, embarrassed by going shopping for shoes with your mother. Oh, this is, uh, this is, um, this is uh, epitome, this is uh, the absolute uh, paradigmatic uh, example of uh, inauthentic uh, conduct, inauthentic behavior. I didn't see my mother for, uh, because my parents were separated and uh, they, I didn't see my mother for uh, between uh, 1938 in 1943, where I made a, a trip to Paris uh, with false uh, papers, with a false uh, identity. Uh, I was four years without seeing my, my mother. And uh, she spent her whole, uh, the whole war in Paris with false uh, papers, false uh, identity card, uh, even the special uh, <coughs> paper in order to, to be able to eat, to, to buy food in the, in the shops. Okay, but she was uh, fearless. She looked extremely Jewish. Golda Meir, compared to my mother, is a pure blonde Aryan. <laughs> well, uh, and she stuttered too. She stuttered because uh, when she came to France at the age of three months, the parents put a pillow on her to, to forbid her to, to, to scream passing uh, the frontier in, uh, secretly. And she started all her life, except when she was angry. Uh, why do I tell you what this is? The inauthentic inner feeling when going, I was just evoking that moment you described. Ah, the going, authentic. Going, uh, going, going. Okay. And I arrived from province, from the mountains of uh, Auvergne, with uh, wooden shoes. Everybody had wooden shoes. But my wooden shoes were, uh, were very ugly, very provincial. And she decided that uh, I should wear uh, beautiful wooden shoes. And she took me in a, in a big shop, which was a Jewish 
before um, <coughs> before the war, which had been Arianized. And uh, she's like me, said Antonin talked very well about this. She could not choose. I cannot choose. To choose is to kill. Uh, and it is the reason why I make such long films. <laughs> Probably. Um, and she asked for to the to, to the to the seller. Okay, show me a, a pair of shoes for my son. Okay, one pair, two pair, three pair, four pair. There was a mountain of boxes of shoes, and it was, she was unable to to choose. And the people started to gather around us with uh, mean faces. And I thought, uh, we will be caught. We will be caught. She was completely unconscious. And, uh, okay, I did not betray my father, but uh, I escaped my mother because I was uh, full of fear that uh, I ran. I left her alone with the mountains of shoes. Uh, nothing to be proud of. Um, and you, you, were, you were also worried by her looks, by the way she looked. <coughs> she, she, was very, she, she was a beauty. She was very beautiful. Now uh, I have pictures of her in my, my home in Paris. And I see how beautiful she is. She was. But uh, she had a Jewish type. And uh, I was an unauthentic Jew. Inauthentic Jew. And full of fear. The fear, I have still the fear in me. This is not... Um, you, you recount in, in, in your book the period of Saint-Germain and the life you were living at that moment and the kinds of writers, kind you, of? of writers and intellectuals you were meeting. Of course, we'll come <coughs> to Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, but there were others. There was Francis Ponge, there was Éluard, there were all kinds of writers. Yes. And uh, when you look back retrospectively now, so many years back, and you look at that period, which in our mind is now extremely, I, I mean, it's iconic. We, in we, our mind? In, in our mind, it's iconic. It's something that we can... Iconic. Uh, iconic. Um, who, who emerges from those writers that is important to you, leaving aside Sartre and, and Simone de Beauvoir? Who emerged? Excuse me, there were great poets, no? Edouard was a great poet. Aragon, too. Francis Ponge, too. Jean Cocteau. My mother was in love with the feet of Cocteau because they were very small. <laughs> and she, she found that my own feet were, uh, were ugly and. Uh, uh, a bad, comment dit on, bad and stupid. She was a strange woman. But she was uh, very strong. She was a genius. She was very co courageous. She, she held the three times in front of the Gestapo. And there was a pictures of uh, Hermann Göring at the wall. And she told to the people of the Gestapo, look at your Göring, he looks more Jewish than me. <laughs> so, so she did this. <clears throat> you, dur during that same period, one of your, your main occupations was stealing books. Was? Stealing books. You enjoyed, no. but uh, you enjoyed, but you enjoyed stealing books and no, certain books it's in particular. It's not It's not enjoyed, but Jean Hippolyte, for instance. Yes. It struck me that you should. 
steal a, a book which was a no, commentary it is, on it is, Hegel. It is complex. It is uh, complicated. Maybe I shouldn't have said you enjoyed stealing books, but in the in the memoir you do write about no, to to steal books of philosophy, very difficult books. It, not exactly uh, the usual uh, stealing. It was a fashion. It's because we read Sartre at this time, uh, novels of Sartre. And we had all admired Sartre very much. Les Chemins de la Liberté, the Path, Ways of Freedom. And in Les Chemins de la Liberté, there are people who steal books. And uh, it was a way to, to testify our admiration for Sartre. But I became, I became a very good uh, stealer, book stealer, one can say thief. Uh, and I, I sold even books uh, with uh, several volumes. How do you say this? <laughs> and I you remember. sometimes went to meet the writers of the and, books. Uh, okay, In the case the, of Hippolyte, he, he wrote uh, you a letter. And Hippolyte, uh, Jean Hippolyte was a famous philosopher, a uh, uh, grand disciple of Jean-Paul Sartre at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, and he was a specialist of uh, Hegel. And of course, uh, we admired very much uh, Hegel because he was a great philosopher, in spite of the fact that he was a German. But many great Many great philosophers were German. And it is the reason why I went to Germany uh, not to teach two to teach. years after the end of the war. Because Germany, is strange to say, but it is the truth, remains the, the, the home, the patrie, the, the heimat of uh, philosophy the homeland. for us. Uh, the you, homeland. Homeland of philosophy. Even today, when I go to, to Berlin, there is a, it's a city I like very much. There is a very small and charming uh, cemetery in the middle of, uh, of Berlin. And in this cemetery, you have the tomb of uh, Hegel of Frau Hegel, Madame Hegel, and the tomb of another great German philosopher, Fichte. And I go there sometimes. It's a, the cemetery is beautiful, and it's a way to, to, pay, tri you, to pay tribute to philosophy. And, and But I go also uh, along the Landwehr Canal, where the body of uh, Rosa Luxembourg after she had been assassinated by the, the Nazi was thrown her corpse. This I go almost every time. When you went to, to Berlin, you, you went to teach a class, and I'm... No, not in Tübingen, in Berlin. I was lector in the Freie Universität Berlin, and you, taught a, and you taught a class on Jean-Paul uh, Sartre and Stendhal. Pardon? You taught a class on Jean-Paul Sartre and Stendhal. Yes, absolutely. I mean, how, how, how did these two figures find themselves together? Well, it would be difficult to explain, but um, uh, in uh, being on nothingness, it is the first great book of philosophy written by Sartre, which appeared in 1943, as a matter of fact. Uh, he has a, a description on what he called la mauvaise foi. Bad faith. Bad faith. How, uh, for instance, uh, a man succeeds to seduce a woman he wants to make love with her, but he, for this he, he climbs the, towards the spirituality, the sky. 
Alors, de, il figurait de, le rouge et le noir, euh, black, how do we say in English? Black the red and the black, the red and the scarlet. So Stendhal, the real question is how Madame de Renal and Julien Sorel can everything separate them, how they, comment ils se rejoignent, how they reach Come together. each other. Reach it. And I, I made a mixture of, uh, of Sartre and Stendhal, very coherent. Coherent, I was, uh, my students like this, liked it very much. The students, the men were all uh, older than me because they came back from the war prisoners camps. The girls at the normal age. But I paid my German taxes, even uh, church tax, Kirchensteuer. I was very proud of this. Some years later, you, you went for your first trip to Israel. Yes. And you, you met Ben-Gurion. And um, in Israel, the seeds of Shoah formed themselves. Pardon? The seeds of Shoah formed themselves. You were told by a state official that you should make a film on the Shoah. Ah, yes, yes, but it was uh, not in 1952. Right. Much later, after I made my first film, Pourquoi Israel? Israel, why? No, but I was not synchron with this story because uh, uh, in 1948, uh, I was not in uh, Israel. I was in Berlin. And during the blockus of Berlin, during the airlift, and I was fascinated by the, the planes, the flying fortress. Um, and it's much later that uh, Oh yes, I forget to say that uh, in 1952, when I uh, went in, uh, to Israel for the first time, I, I discovered because there is one thing which is false, in the, not true in the reflection sur la question juive de Sartre. Two things are very bright, the portrayal of the antisemite and the description of the inauthentic behaviors of the Jews, but uh, one thing is false. He said that the, uh, the Jews are a creation of the anti-Semites. If there wouldn't be anti-Semites, there would be... If there would not be anti-Semites, there would not be Jews. And I discovered when I reached Israel that all this was false. I discovered the, that there were the Jewish people. And, it was and, a, and, a Sartre, great and Sartre was very welcoming. Yes, of because he was uh, he was open. One, one could talk. And you him. went you went on trips with him to Israel. Much later, sir. Much later. But but <coughs> but, but what Sartre, what Sartre was very interested in your in your trips to Israel and actually in your disproving him in you telling him that he was wrong. Yes, I told him, yes. And he admitted. And, and in 19, after you did Why Israel, and you went back again to, to Israel in 19, I think 1973, you met Gershem Sholem, you met the state official, and that is where the seed of Shoah happened. Ah, oh, yes, yes, uh, Shoah is a work of, uh, comment dit-on, œuvre de commande. I was... Uh, Ordered. Uh, I, it was a... Uh, I did not decide to, to cope with this uh, sub subject. I was asked by an Israeli friend, very important. He, um, Aluf Hareven, I think, mm. Director General of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, suggested to you that you make a film on Shoah, he said, a film that is Shoah. But you, but you then came up with uh, the name of Shoah. 
you came up with the word and gave the Holocaust another name. Um, yes, I worked uh, 12 years to, to make sure day after day. It was, a, it was really a war. Every film is a war, but Shoah was a total war in every respect. Um, and, uh, <coughs> could you repeat me your, your question? Um, I'm not sure what the question was. Um, <laughs> oh. No, no, the, your question. My, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I don't remember where I left it off. I, I was saying that this was in, where well, you were saying it is an oeuvre de commande. You worked on it for 12 years. And. Yes. Now I'm, 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 I'm stumped by you. Um, Shoah. Um, you, you say that this film differs from all others because it will focus on what was missing the gas chambers, deaths in the gas chambers from which okay, no one no, had you, returned you, to return. Excuse me, you, you, are, you are too fast. When I was uh, proposed, offered to do this film... You didn't know? I did not know. I had to, to find my subject, the core of the film. And it was not so easy. Uh, to, to find. I remember reading uh, books and books and books on the uh, archives, written archive material, and um, trying to make charts and so on. It was uh, maybe useful, but uh, a little bit uh, stupid. Uh, and I I found my subject after almost two years of war. And my subject, I discovered that Shoah should not be a film about survival. It is by no means a film about survival. It is a film about death, about the radicality of death in the gas chamber. And, uh, when I was, uh, I was, I convinced myself uh, about this. Of course, it gave me the, the keys to, um, <coughs> to 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 make the film. This doesn't mean that it was easy. It was not easy at all. But it is the reason why I decided that there, there should be Germans in the film, there should be perpetrators, killers, in spite of all the difficulties and dangers it, uh, it re represented. But um, this is what is the film about. Because uh, I'd like the, in the second uh, era of Shoah, it is the core of the second era, the difference between a, a concentration camp and an extermination camp. It's not at all the same. Everybody makes the confu confusion. But the survivors uh, don't like me very much and don't like uh, they had very often Shoah, because they are not inside Shoah. Shoah is not a film about survival. It's a film about, uh, about death. And the uh, pro Jewish protagonists of Shoah, they are all members of the Zonder Commando. I choose them because uh, they could testify for the last moments of the Jewish uh, people, they never say I, they never explain how they succeeded to, to escape, not to survive, they are not survivors, they are, I call them in French, uh, revenants. Revenant. 
They are like ghosts. They come from the threshold of the crematorium or even of the gas chamber of Philip Miller. Um, and they were interested only in the fate of the people as a whole, not about their own story. And I was not interested myself. I want us to look at clip number two, if we could. Das ganze Terrain war abgezäumt von SS-Waffen. Die Hunde bellten. Maschinengewehre waren da. Jeder von denen hat gezweifelt. Die polnischen Juden hauptsächlich. Wahrscheinlich ahnten sie auch, dass da etwa nicht stimmt. Aber niemand von denen könnte nicht einmal in den Kleinsten dass er vielleicht in drei, vier Stunden in Asche verwandelt wird. Wenn Sie in den Auskleiderraum gekommen sind, haben Sie da gesehen, dass der Auskleiderraum hat ausgesehen wie ein internationales Informationszentrum. Auf die Wänden waren angebracht Haken und auf jeden Hak war eine Nummer. Und unter den Haken waren Bänke aus Holz, damit sich die Menschen ausziehen können, bequemer, wie sie sagen. Und jetzt auf den vielen Säulen, die stürzten doch diese unterirdische Auskleiderraum, befanden sich viele Plagaten, die auch in vielen Sprachen angebracht. Rein ist fein. Eine Laus, dein Tod. Wasche dich. zum Desinfektionsraum. Viele solche Schildern und Plagaten, und deren Aufgabe es doch war, nur die Menschen in den Gaskammern dann ausgezogen hereinlocken. Und links gegenüber war die Gaskammer. Mit einer massiven Tür ausgestattet. Es ist ein People died uh, together. Men, uh, women, children. Philippe Muller says this beautifully. But it was difficult to, to shoot. The, it was so cold. The camera was frozen. You... There's a, a line by Shoshana Fellman where she says, Shaw is a film made exclusively of testimonies. Made what? Exclusively of testimonies. Mm. It conducts its interviews and takes its pictures in the present. Rather than a simple view about the past, 
The film offers a disorienting vision of the present, a compelling, profound, and surprising insight into the complexity of the relation between history <coughs> and witnessing. Mm. Uh, okay, she wrote a beautiful piece, yes, which I translated myself in print. 100 pages. Better translation than Frank Roy. Uh, this, re this relationship between witnessing and history. Listen, uh, there are no corpses in Shoah. There is no one single corpse. Why? Because uh, there were no corpses in the extermination camp. The people died and uh, were um, burned immediately and the ashes thrown into lakes, river, wind. Um, Shoah is not uh, I wrote to Mr. Ahmadinejad, the president of uh, Iran. He, he says that this never existed. It is a creation of the of the Jews and of the Zionists. And I told him, uh, if you want to see uh, Shoah as a proof that the extermination uh, actually took place, you are very wrong. It is not, Shoah is by no means a proof. There are no corpses. Many people want corpses, you know. And uh, but precisely, it is the lack of corpses, which is the truth. You have uh, in the cemeteries in France, for instance, still you have this. You have many tombs completely empty with a picture on the tomb of a woman, a man, or even a child with a written um, legend or mention uh, killed in Auschwitz in 1942 or 1943. <coughs> but there are no corpses, no, no bones, no nothing. Uh, I don't know if it is, uh, if I answer to your question, uh, about relationship uh, between uh, history and, and witnessing, uh, witnessing, but he, it has always been the case, no? And witnessing. When, when uh, everybody to today said, "Ah, la la, what will happen?" Uh, the, the last witness are uh, dying or disappearing, but they are not witnesses. Excuse me. There is no one single witness. But of they, what happened inside a gas chamber. Nobody returned alive from a gas chamber. Um, yet, yet one of the, the ways in which you manage to tell the story yeah. is through some witnesses in the present time you who re, reenact. I mean, one, I know one of the passages in Shoah that is most meaningful to, to you. The what? One of the passages that is most meaningful to you is the Baba. Yes. And you, you have him quite painfully. I would like us to see it. I'm sure many people have seen it. But you very painfully have him reenact re re his moment. Because you have to to imagine how difficult it is for uh, such a man, for such a people, to, to relate in front of a camera, in front of a cinema team, what they went through, what they did, uh, cutting the hair of the Jewish woman and inside the gas chamber. It's uh, horrible. It is one of the reasons uh, 
I discovered during my, my work that uh, for, for the Jews, for the Jewish protagonists of the film, I had to know as much as possible before shooting in order to be able to help them. And uh, Abraham Bomba, the, the barber of uh, Treblinka, was more and more anxious when the time that, when he should relate this horrible story approached. And I was myself very anxious too. And, and yet uh, you, you push him as you push him to the wall. You push him as far no, as you. No, first of all, excuse me. First of all, uh, I had suddenly the idea to to uh, film this in a hairdressing salon. Why? Because he could make the gesture. And of course, it couldn't be a hairdressing salon for women. It would have been absolutely obscene. Try to imagine this. There were always, during the making of Shoah, ethical questions, which were in the same moment, uh, aesthetical. There no difference. Um, and uh, I proposed him my idea, and he liked it. Okay, he found himself the hairdressing salon. He was not a barber anymore, he was retired. But he had still the yellow, the yellow dress. He was a barber in a Grand Central Station before going to, to Israel on the underground of Grand Central Station here in New York. Um, and uh, when he starts to talk, there are several moments. It's a very complicated, complex scene. Uh, he starts to talk in a completely neutral voice, objective voice, as if it did not happen to him. And he tries to escape every question related to him. And uh, I had to stop him. And to tell him, no, Abraham, it doesn't go like this. And uh, there is a second moment in the scene where he answers to my question, uh, what did he feel uh, when he saw arriving in the gas chamber where he was waiting for the woman with 16 other barbers, when he saw them arriving naked, completely with the children. And he had a, he has a beautiful answer, you saw, to have a feeling over there, uh, uh, living day and night uh, with such a procedure, with, um, among corpses and so on. Your feeling disappeared. You were dead with the feeling. And it is at this very moment that he breaks. Suddenly the feelings come back at full let's look, force. Let's look at clip three if we could. Okay, well, we but had to do the job to get rid of the hair. Like I mentioned that, the Germans, they needed the hair for their purposes. But I have asked you and we didn't answer. What was your uh, impression the first time you saw arriving this naked woman with children. What did you feel? I tell you something. To have a feeling over there, it was very hard to feel anything or to have a feeling. Because working there day and night between the people, between the bodies, men and women, your feeling disappeared. You were dead with your feeling. You had no feeling at all. And matter of fact, I want to tell you something what it happened. At the guest chamber, when I was chosen in over there to work as a barber, some of women that came in from a transport from my town from Chastahova. And from the women, from the number of women, I know a lot of people. You knew them? I know them. I live with them in my town. 
I lived with them in my street. And I was, some of them, they were my close friends. And when they saw me, all of them started hogging me. Abe, hey, this and that, what are you doing here? What's going to help me with us? What could you tell them? What could you tell a friend of mine? He worked as a barber. He was also a good barber in my hometown. When his wife and his sister came into the guest chamber, Today it's going to be very hard. It's taking in with bags. That was transported to the And as I'm in part, you miss it as I'm in part. What is that beside of the of the doers of the of the sun in in Deutschland? Okay, go ahead. Sin. I am his brother, and he knew it. You it is not, I uh, don't torture him, not at all. It is not a sadistic sin. You, he wanted to. By, by saying this, you're answering your critics. Pardon? By saying what you just said, you're answering your critics. Some critics have felt that in these moments you pushed people too much. There are stupid people, yes. <laughs> I didn't push. I didn't push him. He was very, very grateful to me. After this, this very day, 
And when the film was released, I saw him several times. He was, um, he was a great man. I admired him very much. But it was, uh, as Marcelo Fuld said uh, rightly, you cannot uh, make a film like Shohan and uh, respect the, the rules of uh, fairness of a cricket player of uh, Eton. It's, uh, it's a different world. When you, when you say, in, in closing, when you, when you say that he was your brother, one, one of the concepts that comes up towards the end of, of uh, your, your autobiography is the notion of incarnation. It is incarnation. The tears of Bomba are incarnation. The tears of Bomba are uh, the seal of truth. They are more precious than blood. Shoah is, is an experience. It is a real incarnation. Not only him, but... What does that protagonist. mean? What? What does that mean? Incarnation, it means uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the only possible uh, resurrection. You cannot see this. And, uh, Without, uh, <coughs> you vous épousez, je ne sais pas comment on dit. You, you espouse, you fill. Yes, you, you. It's a problem for you that it is an incarnation? No. It's really. It is. Uh, no, I, it's not a problem at all. I want to understand better. Because you've been asked and you've said Shoah, uh, in, in one word, is about incarnation. Yes. yes. Um, what do, do, you, do you want that I add? It's, it's very clear, no? When I say to you it is... Yeah. Uh, the seal of truth. I think it is. Uh, he's not a, a man with a tie uh, telling a souvenir. It's much stronger than any souvenir. Souvenirs are, are completely weak. It is not souvenir. He relives. I mean, you he push again. But you put them in, the situ in that situation of reliving. Yes, but he, he agreed to this. Don't uh, forget that uh, I spent two days on one night with him, uh, two or three years before the actual shooting, in the mountains uh, upset uh, New, New York. I had no camera, I had no tape recorder, uh, hardly a pen, and I listened at him for um, two days and on one night. And I told him, um, I asked him if he would agree to appear in this film. He said yes. I told him I cannot tell you when. I am not even sure that the film will ever exist, uh, and I lost him, because I, Time I had to, when I shot with him, he was living in Israel, not, not anymore in the United States, but... Uh, you tracked him down. I had to, yes, but I wanted, I, I knew in advance songs to this two days, uh, as much as possible, of him. But I didn't force uh, the tears. This, this came because of the camera, because of the actual shooting. It was very important for the incarnation. 
and uh, on this uh, with this camera I had to, to reload every 11 minutes and it is a co complicated scene and I felt during the shooting that something was a, a tension was a climbing there was a tension I thought that something could happen I did not know what, what, when, and I was not sure. But uh, there is, um, I look behind the camera, there is a counter, how do you say a counter? Uh, timer. Uh, Time, timer. A counter. You, 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 one can read how many meters of film remain, of a virgin film and remained uh, five or six minutes. I don't remember exactly. It is, in one way, it is much. But uh, I obeyed to uh, an intuition, and I said to, the, to my cameraman very slowly, coop, we cut, and we reload immediately. There were uh, uh, the magazines, how did we Shops. No, no, pas no. chaud. The, 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 oh, the, pas d'importance, continuez. Non, mais si, il y a... Et, ok, oui. <coughs> we put a new film. A new film, 11 minutes. And the... He, he broke at the very moment uh, where I wouldn't have, there wouldn't remain film in the camera if I had not obeyed to my intuition and changed it. I could not have asked him, please uh, cry again. <laughs> no, this is the, what is incarnation. It is not theater, so. The, the, tit the, tit the t title of the book. The what? The title of the book. To end with the title of the book. Is another form of incarnation. It is what? The title of the book. Yes. Le titre du livre. Yes. Is another form of incarnation. It is an incarnation. Incarnation is my only problem. One has to, the question is very simple. Is the world a decor or not? If the world is a decor, when you, like when you are in a very fast train, the world is a decor, you don't see anything. Okay? But uh, incarnation happens in this book at several moments. And it happened in Shoah most uh, of the time. And... Uh, when I was in uh, Patagonia, for instance, I was talking to myself because I was happy to be in Patagonia. I was alone. I was 70. And uh, in the far south of uh, Argentina. And uh, I rented a car and I started to drive uh, northwest towards the border of uh, Chile. I wanted to see the, the glaciers, the, the beautiful glacier, Perito Moreno and so on. All right, but there was a beautiful, immense sky. And I was talking to myself, this happens rather often in my life. I talked to me. Uh, and I was uh, telling, to my, please, you are in Patagonia, you should explode with, uh, with joy. I was happy to be in Patagonia, but I did not explode. Patagonia remained a decor. I saw even uh, llamas, was a fur, you know, it's really Patagonia. Okay, Patagonia remained a decor. 
And at the very end of the day, when I left the, <coughs> the main road, the asphalt road, for, uh, I had seen 90 kilometers to, to drive on a bad, uh, very bad road on a piste. And suddenly I saw a hare crossing my, in front of my headlights. And I did everything I could in order not to kill him, the hare. And I succeeded, I did not kill him. But my heart exploded. I was suddenly in Patagonia. And I say this is in the book, Patagonia and me and I, we were true together. This is what is incarnation. Thank you very much. Yeah.